Nigel Cannings, I, I want to start with you um, with with a question about Gen AI. How important do you feel Gen AI is going to be to to your organization, Intelligent Voice, uh, or for your clients' organizations over the next uh, two to five years? Well, I mean, it's it's going to be revolutionary. I mean, we and we're seeing now. I mean, it was quite interesting that Beth talking about twenty four percent of companies not using Gen AI at the moment. I bet they are because it's a shadow IT problem at the moment. Um, what you're finding in a lot of organizations is employees are going on to ChatGPT, they're drafting things in there. So even if the organization itself doesn't feel that it's using Gen AI, in many cases, its employees already are. And we're gonna see that ripple through um, over the next couple of years. I do think that we have to be careful to split out the notion of Gen AI as a technology and Gen AI as a product. We, we, tend, we tend to kind of interchange them. You know, chat GPT is a product, but Gen AI is a technology. And, and where I think Gen AI is really gonna start to come in is not individual organizations trying to implement Gen AI as a technology. What we're gonna see is solution providers who are embedding Gen AI into their own products. And so that's where organizations are really gonna engage with it, whether they know it's there or not. I think the issue is that when an organization itself tries to implement this, it's a bit like um, trying to run your own database. I mean, it, it's it, you wouldn't wanna do that in many cases. Um, and because of some of the ethical and privacy concerns that we have with organizations trying to implement their own AI, I can actually see maybe we'll have a lot doing it in the next two years, but actually in five years' time, the majority of it's actually going to be coming in through third-party solution providers who are experts in the field. N Nigel, thank you. Um, uh, and I, I have a question for, for Chad Burton. Um, Chad, how do you see AI and Gen AI uh, changing the deal-making process in the next uh, two to five years? What, what changes are you seeing at Piper Sandler or elsewhere? Thank you, Todd. And I'd like to start by saying I'm, we feel the same issues that Nigel's experiencing, that, again, the shadow programs and, and what's happening behind the scenes. But from an investment bank, financial services company, we have very locked down strict parameters around data privacy, um, NDAs around client data. So we're, we're approaching it internally very carefully. We have been building out some large language models and other machine learning algorithms to, to, to help codify some of the data and, and do analyses. But what we have found easiest is to partner externally with third party providers. Data site being a great example. So where I see changes, I see changes in the large language model. So the written code. So whether that's drawing from an internal um, data, a codified data source, so all pitch books, all emails, all kind of written information that is segmented by whether it's industry or product, I see that being a very important piece to start. Second piece is data. Data is massive and getting bigger all the time. So We've partnered with a third party that's helping us to load, use the, the processing power that's in the cloud and, and really generatively start understanding and, and seeing patterns in the data sets. So those are key items. So data site is a great example from intelligence of creating buyers lists using the outreach tool. So what we're seeing is both an efficiency, adding potential buyers that may be unknown to us at the time or augmenting the list we already have. And then as we go out to clients, so these become a seamless process between cur curating the list and the outreach. You know, we, we've already seen the reduction of the, kind of that human error of attaching the wrong documentation to the wrong email and different things. So we see a lot of things coming. I think we also see that as these large language models improve, you know, the amount of time spent in presentations, whether it's the pitch itself, whether it's the, the SIM process, is that if it can start drawing from internal sources, help write it, that's going to be a huge step. But we also see that part of that is also, I think error checking will be a big part of it as well. So you can start as you go through that banking process, see that there's going to be clear opportunities to, to really improve and, and create efficiencies. And as we think about efficiencies, is it 10 or 20% now and 
you know, and, and what, how that changes the employee workforce, we don't know. But I think the, the initial efficiencies will end up in giving us opportunities to do more and do efficiently in, in banking, create work-life balance, which is always a number one goal. Okay, thanks, Chad. Um, uh, Nigel, what uh, what are the top concerns facing the workforce today with the, the growing adoption of Gen AI tools? Well, well, I think we're we're going to face an expertise problem going forward because um, what we're seeing is that. Gen AI is fantastic at dealing with routine, mundane type of tasks. So we're going to see it employed much more in, in call centers, in chatbots, in, you know, doing a whole range of, of tasks, you know, doing um, kind of contract reviews for due diligence, all of this type of stuff, you know, summarization. And, and that's going to be fantastically useful and done at a wide scale. But how are we going to train the experts of tomorrow? Because we still need human beings at the top who ultimately can answer the hard questions. And I always think about this in, in the contact center space, but it, it applies to lawyers, it applies to accountancy, it applies everywhere. Um, you know, the, the person who answers that hardest question in the call center is actually the person who started one day on the phone asking very, answering very routine questions. Um, in the same way, I was I was a lawyer before I was a technologist, and I learned my craft by reading other people's contracts and, you know, doing small bits of drafting. Eventually, I became good at what I did. If we've replaced all of that with machines, how are we going to train experts in the future? And, and for me, that's the number one problem that companies are going to face if they de-skill using Gen AI. I'd like to see Gen AI coexist and be used as something which augments current processes rather than replacing them. But I think too many companies are looking at replacing rather than augmenting. Uh, I, I want to ask a, a related question um, that came in from uh, one of our attendees, Damien Lamas, who is asking, is there evidence of roles um, being replaced by Gen AI assisted processes. Um, does uh, do, do, you, do you have a view on how that might evolve? Um, well, maybe I'll start with Nigel and go go to Chad for that. Yeah, I mean, I at the moment what we're seeing is is mainly augmentation. So um, what we're seeing is that people are doing things more quickly. So again, a call center example: when you finish a call in a call center, you have to type a whole lot of notes up about what happened in that call. Well, you can now use Gen AI to wrap what's called a wrap up bot, which basically does that for you. It listens into the call, it summarizes it, it puts all the actions in, it does it. So that's augmentation. Um, so we're certainly not seeing replacement yet, but as I said, I can definitely see um, organizations thinking at least that they can lean in that direction. Um, I think it's a very dangerous direction to, to go in personally, but um, you know that that's what we that's certainly what we're seeing. Not people being replaced, but maybe Chad seeing something different to me. Nigel, that's a, that's a great lead in, and we feel the same way about that loss of knowledge and expertise. And so we've been working with our training vendor to start developing the skill set. And I think first of it, it starts with that certification of experience, right? What do you know in accounting? What do you know in finance. And, and if you don't have a baseline, you're a liberal arts major. And, and so to build that out so that we feel like we have, you know, a real kind of something we can work from. With that said, we could see, you know, that evolution of experience going from execution, Excel to really abstract and creative. So we started a training class of 120 people on Monday. And as we started talking about technology and where we're at within our journey at, at Piper Sandler, the one thing I said is like, well, how many people, question of the group, how many people have used ChatGPT or some other you know, experience to write papers, get questions answered, and hands all shot up. And, and so it's universally across the board. So I think I always say things happen for a reason. I, I think their knowledge and experience they're gaining is, is teaching them what are the prompts I need to ask. How do I get through these data sets and manage this as we go forward? On the flip side of that, and, and you know, do we see changes in in the numbers of people or whatever. I, I think it'd be silly for us to not anticipate some of that. You know, again, I think the first level of efficiencies is just do more, do better, get better balance. But I think as you go into the next, you know, that's probably the first kind of couple three, but the next kind of three to, you know, infinity beyond that is it, it 
the efficiencies really, really start to change and accelerate it. And we saw this somewhat with outsourcing, you know, to, to various locales, certain repetitive skills, you know, that in that, all right, pull this comp group, create this, you know, create this uh, company profile. It's like that stuff is easy. That's the stuff you can see being, re, you know, the large language models easily replacing and, and moving quickly. The biggest issues, data. We get tons of data files in Excel, CSV, whatever the whatever the forms are. That's the stuff that's hard, and that's why we started partnering with external sources to to really say, okay, how do we load this? How do we use that processing power that's in the cloud? Because data sets are getting bigger. I'm not sure if that's you know again the, the analysis, the analytics behind the scenes. That's the piece that the evolution is like. How do you draw out those KPIs of what's important to you, to your client, and the message you're giving to your clients? Chad, thank you. I, I want to ask you a question that came in from uh, from one of our attendees, uh, Lucas Richter, who's asking which which phases of uh, of an M and A transaction uh, do you expect AI, uh, AI or Gen AI to have the the, the most uh, have the biggest impact? And just to piggyback off that, maybe making the question a little broader, uh, which areas are you using Gen AI for or other AI or machine learning in your role? All right. So from the, from the banking side, I think the biggest, the biggest changes are going to be in the written. Is the starting is going to be in the writing, right? How quickly you can put and assemble data, do research internally. We have a lot of repeat business within investment banking. So how do we position this last time to go through and pull the last two pitches, three sims, whatever it happens to be, and, and really start quickly doing that. Also incorporating not only the internal data sets, but external. Okay, what else is new? What else don't we know since the last time this was written? That's one. Two, I think the as these data sets get bigger, as we you know develop better AI to really generatively understand, is this revenue, is this expense, is this, you know, how does this fit within the, you know, the, the full um, body of work is, is that that analysis can be drawn out a lot quicker. Where we're using, say the name, I guess, Blue Ops Diligent the most, we've already seen that loading of data sets have gone from kind of a couple, three weeks, I mean, massive data sets to something that can be done in 20% or even less of the time required to, to use either Excel or Tableau. So those those loading mechanisms, that ability to, to sense and cleanse and manage those data sets is, has really saved a lot of efficiency. Thanks. We have a few more questions, but not just like in my role specifically and or directly within the bank, you know, this is the day-to-day. -day. We shut down ChatGPT internally. Um, you know, because of security risk. Again, I mentioned at the very beginning is the ability to know what's going back and forth across the pipeline. You know, what is out in the, you know, in the public sphere of, of knowledge and information. So we're, we're, we're carefully approaching it, but we've got a fantastic IT team that is looking at it, that is, you know, getting close to deploying Piper GPT or some version of, of OpenAI. So we're, we're definitely working on it. It's definitely important. And I think the, democratization of data is going to be really key to what can we go back clearly defining that and, and managing it. And I think I heard Nigel mention it earlier. We're not trying to manage the whole internet, right? We want to be able to manage what we have and then work with our main market data service providers or whoever the, you know, the group is at the time to come, you know, bring all of that together to, to do better analysis, to better KPIs, to get better vision of where we think we're headed. Chad, thank you. We we have time for a couple more minutes. Uh, we have a couple more minutes for, for other questions, but I, I want to make sure to, to ask one. Um, I want to start with Nigel on this one. Um, and this is from um, from one of our attendees, Nanand, uh, Nanandi Subramanya, who's asking um, if there's, there's you know, there's concern about uh, about AI taking over roles. But what what kinds of, of brand new jobs do you see? Um, do you, do you expect to see resulting from uh, you know the ascendance of Gen AI into the workplace? What what kinds of new jobs do you see coming along? Well, we're already seeing the the growth of the chief AI officer in a lot of organizations. So we're going to have a lot of things over the next kind of few years, which have got you know we're going to be AI washing a lot of jobs here. Um, 
Uh, and so, but but there are, you know, I think that we're going to actually start to see things like, um, you know, AI ethics boards, which are staffed with people who are expert in, in those areas. So I actually think a lot of the... Um, we're going to see reskilling in security, and, and Chad touched on this as well, in ethics, uh, but also, you know, people who are going to be modeling things like the energy usage, for example. So, you know, I, I'm actually thinking that the ESG is going to suddenly start to play a really big role in organizations where they're saying, hang on a second, you know, we're using this stuff and we've just, you know, we've just burnt down a rainforest with all of the, uh, the work that we've done. So I think there's going to be a lot of kind of adjacent jobs to um, what's happening with AI. I'm not, you know, I'm not necessarily sure in five years' time, though, that we're going to have a huge number of jobs which have still got AI in the title. They'll get folded back in to existing roles. The chief AI role will get come back under the CIO or under the, the CTO. Um, but, you know, maybe, maybe Chad's got some thoughts on a, on a few new roles that might be coming out. You know, at this point in time, I grew up, I, going way back, I'm a CPA by training, and the, the advent of the computers didn't diminish the number of analysts, right? So there's, there's not analysts, accountants, there's still accountants running all over the place, internal auditors. So again, it's an evolution of what are you doing with your time? Where are you focused and where are you headed? I, I think a quote I heard from somebody as I was thinking about technology and where we're going is that chat GPT or AI won't take your job the person that knows how to run it will, right? So you, you got to think about how do I improve? How do I get training? How do I manage? And everyone, again, that we're working with is thinking along that continuum of increasing the knowledge and development. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm going to ask one lightning round question to Nigel. Um, why do companies need to act on Gen AI right now? And what should they actually be doing to prepare their workforces for, for the capabilities it brings in? Um, well, they should, I mean, everyone should be looking at it um, to see how they can streamline the business processes now, but they should be doing it with a very jaundiced and weather eye. Um, Chad's kind of hit on a whole load of the issues around security and ethics and data privacy. So what they should really be doing is training people. I'd be training them on the dangers of Gen AI at the moment. That's where I'd start and work backwards from there. And as I said, look at using third-party service providers who've thought through all these problems themselves and understand the questions you should be asking of your providers. You know, is this stuff ethical? Um, you know, what's the security model around there? You know, what's happening to my data? All this type of stuff. So I think we train people to be um, kind of skeptical of it and ask the right questions. That's what I'd be doing right now. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, we could keep talking about this for an hour, I'm sure, but unfortunately, uh, we're out of time. It's been a great conversation. Uh, Nigel, Chad, and Beth, uh, thank you so much for being with us today. And thanks to everybody for joining us um, on this webinar. Uh, thanks especially to Nigel Cannings from Intelligent Voice and Chad Burton from Piper Sandler. And thanks also to Dr. Beth Tracton Bishop from HBR Analytics Services. Our producer at HBR today is Samantha Berry. Thanks to her and to our partners at On24, and a big thanks to Datasite for making this discussion possible. This concludes our presentation. Have a great day.